The D.T. Porter Building. Our history expert solves local mysteries. Who, what, when, where, why, and why not? Well, sometimes. An article by Vance Lauderdale brought to you by Memphis, the City Magazine. Dear Vance, is it true that the D.T. Porter Building's elevator, the first one in Memphis, was actually operated by mules? This from GM from Memphis. Dear GM, if you're asking if mules operated the elevator car by pressing the buttons with their hooves, then I give you a hard no on that. And if you are instead wondering if mules somehow lifted and lowered the car carrying passengers to all floors of the impressive office building that overlooks Court Square, a downtown landmark for more than a century, then I'm going to give you a hard no on that as well. I'm sorry to disappoint you. To answer your question, I study the history of elevators. Not the most fun way to spend a night in the Lauderdale Mansion, though I've had worse. And then hundreds of years ago, various animals tugged on ropes and pulleys to raise platforms during the construction of buildings. But these were smaller structures. And if somebody decided to engage animals to carry passengers to the roof of a 12-story building, would mules really be the best choice? I mean, aren't they called stubborn as a mule for a reason? I wouldn't want to be stuck in an elevator car when the mule decided it was time to rest and chew on hay or whatever it is that they enjoy. Besides, how would this elevator mule system have worked? It's too depressing to think they stayed in the basement walking endlessly in a treadmill linked to the elevator car. And no old photos I've ever seen of Main Street show mules plodding alongside Court Square, hooked to cables, walking back and forth to raise and lower the car. So, put the mules out of your mind. Back in 1853, an inventor named Elijah Otis presented the first passenger safety elevator at the Central Palace Convention in New York City. By the time workers completed the D.T. Porter building in 1895, advanced machinery, steam-powered, hydraulic, electrical, was available for elevators. I'm not saying these systems were as safe and reliable as they are now. After all, it wasn't until 1877 that somebody thought to install automatic doors on elevators. Until then, a disturbing number of impatient passengers opened the doors themselves and tumbled down an empty shaft. Everything suggests that, even though the Porter Building elevator was indeed the first in Memphis, it wasn't a crude animal-powered prototype. Even so, it was a novelty here, and Memphians paid 10 cents to ride to the roof of what was then the tallest building in town. So let me ask a question for a change. Who was D.T. Porter, and why was this grand building named after him? Well, since this is my column, I'll answer that. He was born on a farm in Robertson County, Tennessee in 1827, moved with his family to Kentucky, then to Nashville, and then to Memphis. Even though he was always called Doctor, it even says so on the building and his tombstone, he never seems to have practiced medicine. Some biographers believe that Porter actually held a degree in pharmacy, but he never bothered with that occupation either. In her book, Elmwood 2002, In the Shadows of the Elms, historian Pierre Magnus has this to say about David Tinsley Porter, the full name he rarely used. In 1857, he came to Memphis and entered the grocery and commission business with various partners. During the yellow fever epidemic of 1873, he was an indefatigable member of the Citizens Relief Committee. He assumed far more important roles in our city during the more dreadful 1878 yellow fever epidemic. Magnus quotes from an earlier historian, J.M. Keating, author of A History of Memphis, Tennessee, with biographical sketches, first published in 1888, who notes that when Memphis lost its charter and became a taxing district, the people of Memphis were so well acquainted with Porter as a successful merchant, a man of great character and incorruptible integrity, as well as of rare benevolence, that they at once selected him for the very responsible position of president of the taxing district 
the equivalent of mayor, president of the Board of Works and Recorder. Back to Magnus. He initiated sanitary reforms and sewer building and did much to contribute to the building of the city. Those efforts, among others, eliminated the breeding grounds for the mosquitoes that carried the deadly fever. And now, for one last time, back to Keating. Porter devoted himself with singleness of purpose to the work of rehabilitating a city, putting fresh blood in its veins and reviving it from the very jaws of death. Magnus notes that in the late 1800s, Porter was also president of Memphis National Bank, president of Planters Fire Insurance Company, president of Gayoso Oil Seed Works, director of the Brush Electric Light Company, and a trustee of the Leith Orphan Asylum. After his death in 1898, his name was added to that institution, known today as Porter Leith. He was laid to rest in Elmwood alongside his wife, Mildred, and his son, Willie, both of whom had died before him. Porter's grave is marked with an impressive monument shown above, but his family decided he deserved a much larger memorial. In 1900, they purchased the Continental National Bank building, which had been constructed on Main Street, and renamed it the Dr. T.T. Porter Building. Let that be a lesson to all my half-dozen readers. Do good deeds during your lifetime, and your heirs might buy a bank and rename it after you. It could happen. The D.T. Porter Building stands today, looking as nice as it had opened. It is one of our city's most astonishing architectural creations. Architect Edward C. Jones had designed nice homes and churches across the South. This was supposedly his first skyscraper, and I mean this in the nicest way. It seems like he changed his mind about the design with every story. No other building in our city looks quite like it. The Society of Architectural Historians describes its unique style in this way. The Main Street elevation is 11 stories high, though a third of the building is one additional story on the side facing Court Square. The rhythm of the fenestration on this west side is idiosyncratic. The expected grid of square windows is interrupted by an asymmetrical arrangement of rounded arches on the 4th, 7th, and 10th floors. The further breakup symmetry, the main entrance, flanked by Corinthian columns of red granite, is located in the 5th or 6th bays. Stylistically, the building combines elements from the Italian Renaissance and Richardsonian Romanesque. The next time anyone is strolling along Main Street or visiting Court Square, I encourage them to pause and study this building. The details really are remarkable, and it's one of my favorite structures in Memphis. Continental National Bank closed around 1900. Over the years, other businesses moved in, occupying the ornate lobby in the upper floors. In 1983, New owners renovated the building top to bottom and converted it to apartments, adding a rooftop deck. I should point out that the elaborate exterior only applies to the north and west sides of the D.T. Porter building. The east and south sides are plain brick because developers assumed other buildings would go up next door, blocking any windows placed on those walls. But that never happened. So two sides remained blank until 1974 when a project called Downtown Wall Art of Memphis provided funds for local artists to paint super graphics on various buildings. My pal, Wayne Dowdy, with the Memphis and Shelby County Room, turned up that information, noting that the newspaper articles about this project, though listing more than a dozen artists who participated, never specified who painted this particular mural. Perhaps by the time you read this, I can tell you more about the artist. I wrote to ask Vance, but I'm still waiting for a reply. Have you got a question for Vance? Email him at askvance at memphismagazine.com or mail Vance Lauderdale, Memphis Magazine, Post Office Box 1738, Memphis, Tennessee, 38101 
or visit his Facebook page. You'll find the link below this video. Vance Lauderdale is the history columnist for Memphis Magazine and Inside Memphis Business. His dramatic life story is so well known that school children are taught to recite it for extra credit. If you enjoy Vance's musings, why not subscribe to the Memphis Magazine weekly newsletter and find all that is happening now and has happened in and around Memphis. The email is free and you can find the link below this video to get your adventure started. Did I mention it's free?